so let me start with just a question. Have any of you ever been wrong in your entire lives? <laughs> wow, you guys are not only two people have ever been wrong. <laughs> All right, who, who, who thinks they might be wrong about something anywhere in their lives right now? Well, you guys are, are IGs? What are we, <laughs> we going to do? Okay, no, so, you know, part of life is sometimes we have wrong ideas, right? I know I've had many, many wrong ideas. My son reminds me that he only has like five words, right? And he's still <laughs> very effective at telling me how wrong I am uh, about things. Uh, so I want to jump back in time, because we've been wrong as a human species about all sorts of things to different degrees, and back in time we're even like more wrong than we are about some things. Uh, now, for example, we used to think that uh, this, the sun revolved around the Earth. Uh, but you know, that makes sense, right? If you go outside and you look at the sun, it's, it's going around the Earth, right? So you look at the data that was available, and someone would say, no, 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 the Earth is going around the sun. You're like, what do you mean, like we're spinning in space in orbit? That's crazy. We see it. It's right there. It's going around. We had some other crazy theories as well. Uh, one of my favorite is the emission theory of vision. That's where you open your eyes and beams shoot out, and they reflect off of things, and that's how we see the world, right? Uh, I prefer that theory to like light bouncing off things. It's much more exciting to be like Superman with less fire and destruction. Uh, and then, you know, we also have theories about fire, for example. Like fire was locked in. It's called phlogiston. It was like locked in objects, and you heat them up, and the fire gets set free. I was going to tell you how fire actually works, but I don't know. So I'll just have to <laughs> end on that. So wh why am I telling you about these theories we don't believe in anymore? It's because it took a lot of effort to go from those theories to what we believe now, and that effort was a lot of it was through the scientific uh, process. And what I'd like to argue is that process, I think, can inform how we think about the issues we're dealing with right now as IGs with data. Uh, and the world of science has been dealing with huge piles of data for a long time, and I think it's informative that even with access to a lot of data, we still often make wrong conclusions. Uh, so the key point is that coming to a right conclusion isn't just about having data, it's about taking the time to interpret that data and appreciate you might be wrong. And you guys might, I mean, I'm going to be right about everything, right, but maybe. Okay, so what's, you probably saw something like this in middle school, or high, I, for, I forgot when they teach this stuff, but like, you know, science, how does science work? Well, the first thing we do is we gather data, and here at the IGs, we're gathering data all the time, both as part of our investigations, audits, and evaluations, and also in part of our internal metrics. And then we ask questions about that data, right? You know, how should we perform this audit? Who should we target for uh, investigation? Uh, why do our internal metrics look the way we do? Uh, and then we develop predictions. We say, hey, I think this is the area where we're going to get the most uh, if we investigate, or I think this is how we should per perform the audit. And then we take action, right? Even though we might be wrong about things, we can't just sit in a room pondering, as fun as that might be, wondering where we might be wrong. We need to, we need to act. Uh, but I think the key idea of science is, is you don't stop at that point, right? You don't stop and say, yep, audit's done. I don't need to worry about that anymore. That's history. Uh, and say, we say, well, what do we learn? Right? What do we learn from implementing that policy or making that decision? Uh, and then we use that to inform our next action. And this is the process involved in, in science, right? Is we get things wrong constantly, but every time we try to iterate and move closer uh, to the truth. So what I want to, like, this is like the big take home point, and then we'll have a lot of like little examples is the idea that any time you make a decision, you should ask yourself, how am I going to figure out if this decision is wrong? Right? It should be built into that decision-making process. Because the idea is we know we're wrong about things. And if you think about the past when you were wrong, when you were wrong, you weren't like, you know what? I'm wrong about this. Because once we know we're wrong, we're, we're right inherently. Right? So being wrong <laughs> is inherently a state of ignorance. Otherwise, you would just correct it immediately. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to sell you on, is you should work into your processes the thought of, I'm going to figure out whether I'm wrong, and I'm going to build it into my process for a year now. I'm going to go back to this important decision in my life and see how I was uh, wrong so I can improve for the, the future. So one thing you might be thinking is, well, I'm, I don't need to worry about this. We've got metrics, right? Metrics will save us. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is some stories that metrics are like the incredible Hulk. Like they're very competent at doing all sorts of things, some of which is wrecking total destruction upon everything. Though if you saw the new Marvel movie, he's like a happy scientist Hulk now, so you just have to erase that. All right, uh, so, so now we're shifting to the idea of we're going to figure out whether we're wrong by implementing metrics, right? And those metrics, and this is the big thing in the government now, metrics are important. Uh, but the issue with metrics is that humans are like really smart, and so sometimes we're able to figure out ways to get the number in the metric without doing the thing you actually want them to do. All right, so I've got a couple uh, stories for you. Uh, so this one's very serious, and this is a fantastic report. You'll see the other ones I have like graphics, but this report from VAOIG is phenomenal. It's like a 153-page report, but they do 
a really great analysis on what's a very serious problem, and that is veteran wait times. So if you remember in the news a while back, uh, veterans were having trouble getting appointments. Uh, and worse still, there were issues with schedulers in fact hiding the issues with getting an appointment. So I'm a veteran, I need a primary care appointment, I call the scheduler, and the scheduler looks and sees there's no appointment for four months. So that scheduler knows that the VA is emphasizing wait times, right? The VA has made wait times a metrics. They're going to improve this. And the scheduler also knows he might get in trouble if the headquarters sees how bad they're doing with wait times. So what that scheduler does is he takes that uh, request and he puts it in a separate system. He doesn't actually log it. And this was being done systematically. And to get an idea how serious the problem was, there's an email that's in the VA uh, OIG report in which someone says, hey, I think it's like Hawaii is like emailing Phoenix. Phoenix, you're crushing it in wait times. How are you doing it? And the manager says, smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah. So it's tragic, really, because the VA uh, had these metrics. And these metrics were critical to its performance. But by emphasizing the metrics, they actually corrupted the metrics. And it wasn't on a total national scale, but a widespread issues with wait times being corrupted because they were so important. So you can see where we're getting at here. It's not just enough that you have a process of checking things. That process itself must be robust. Uh, so here's a second example. You know, when you were in high school, you probably knew students who cheated. I think back in middle school, I might have even cheated once or twice. I shouldn't say that in public, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> They were very small quizzes, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it didn't, maybe it didn't happen. Let's just, okay, so <laughs> what this is, is it is like a flip thing. So you know with the Department of Education had some funding that was linked to standardized test scores, right? So what, they, so what Atlanta did is like, man, it's really hard to teach students. We have a much better idea. We'll give the students the tests, and then we'll erase the wrong answers and bubble in the right answers, right? And sure enough, performance skyrocketed. I think the superintendent of the school system got an award for the best superintendent. Uh, and it wasn't until a newspaper investigated and said, wait a second, why are all these wrong answers erased and replaced with right answers? And there were over 100 people involved in this cheating scheme across uh, uh, Georgia. So it was a really big, a really big deal. Uh, well, what happened there? Again, we want to know how our students are performing. It's really important. We set up a metric in place in order to track that. But what happened, the metric got corrupted because people said, hey, we're so smart, we're going to achieve this metric without the hard work of actually getting students to perform better. Um, now, in that case, it turned out that the Department of Education actually had a system in place. So they, they're smart, thinking ahead, Department of Education says, we're going to track this, and we're going to look for school systems that might be cheating the system. But what uh, Department of Education IG found is, even though Georgia had been flagged by the system, Department of Education took no action. And this comes into place. Any system you put in place, if you go back and you're feeling pumped, you're like, you know what? I am going to check for errors. You know, I'm making this really big decision, and I'm going to check for it. Well, if you put that system in place and then ignore it, it's not going to actually uh, help you at all. All right, so it turns out that even when people do the thing they're supposed to do, you know, like shorten wait times or improve student performance, metrics can still have unintended uh, consequences. Uh, so this first example is, uh, we'll give the background and then the details since we're in the patent building. I should at least, you know, give the context here. The patent office actually has a really robust system uh, for dealing with production targets. And it's, it's actually, whether those targets are high enough is one question, but in terms of keeping people from cheating the system, like we talked about uh, with the other metrics, it's really, really good. Uh, but one issue with it is they focus so much on production, they don't care quite as much, or at least when this report came out, on whether workers are working their hours, right? Because they're focused on production and not necessarily employee utilization. And so what the Commerce IG found is they said, hey, when we look at records that people say they're working, we estimate at least 300,000 hours uh, have not been worked. And they were pretty lenient on that. Like, there was no evidence of them even entering the building or turning on their computer that day. And the patent office said, well, look, we might have some issues on that, but we're really good at hitting our production targets, which, which was true. But then I think Commerce reasonably responded and said, hey, just because you have this as a metric doesn't mean you should ignore other dimensions that are maybe more difficult to measure or aren't your, you know, your main thing you're, you're looking at. So, you know, and here are some things that I would do if I were not at work. I would probably sleep a lot. As I said, I have a kid. Water my garden, that's all dying in weeds. And not play video games because I'm an adult. All right. <laughs> maybe go grocery shopping instead. All right. Um, so uh, here's, here's the last uh, story. And do you remember, like, 10 years back, there was that thing where, like, the economy had a little bit of trouble? You know, like, yeah. yeah. Well, AIG remembers, right? Like, Pepperidge Farm remembers. Because 
they uh, lost $62 billion of that, which was a record, and I think it is a, still a record loss. Uh, well, how did they perform that amazing feat, right? Well, it turns out they're an insurance company, and the way insurance companies work is they're for buying risk, right? They, you're going you're gonna to pay them money, and they're going to, if something bad happens, give you something in return. So what, what that means is when they sell a product of insurance, they're immediately getting money, right? It shows up on their books. They've got new customer. They're expanding market share. And then they've got this wispy number, which is they might have to pay money out in the future. Uh, so with the case of AIG, they sold a lot of these credit default, default swaps, which are insurance on, on bonds. Uh, and they were so driven by the profits, the risk analysis got sort of pushed out into the corner. So when the economy crashed, they were totally left out to dry, devastated, uh, and destroyed as a company. Look at their stock. I mean, it's pretty much got evaporated. The government had to take them over. Um, and again, their metric, they had the metric of profits. That was important to them. And people really were selling, you know, they were gaining market share, selling these credit default swaps. But by focusing on that metric and letting the focus on risk that, uh, get de-emphasized, it caused an absolute uh, catastrophe. All right. So where does that bring us? You know, we sort of zoom through a bunch of examples. Let me sort of give back, step back and give you uh, the big picture. So we start with the idea that we're all wrong, all of us, even those who didn't raise your hand. You just are wrong about that as a starting point. <laughs> uh, and then we ask the question of, well, how can we keep ourselves you know, from being wrong? And the idea is, it's a 15 minute talk, so I'm not, you know, not going to give you all the details, not to mention I don't have all the details for everything. Uh, but the important thing is that whenever you make a decision, here's my concrete thing I'm going to recommend to you. You set a calendar reminder for like a year in advance. And you, there's two things for that calendar reminder. One, it makes you think, hey, I'm making this really important decision. When am I going to do a year from now to check whether that decision was the right one? So it makes you put something in place to hold yourself accountable. And then when that calendar reminder goes off and you forgot you even made that decision, right? It reminds you like, oh yeah, I'm the reason this happened. Was it the right way to act? and trying to build into your processes a way to check yourself uh, in order to sort of correct some of those wrong ideas. Because there's a tendency, and I do this all the time, where I'll make a wrong decision, and then in the future, I'm like, that wasn't me. Don't be ridiculous. That was circumstances arising around me in an in unstoppable way. Um, OK, then we also talked about metrics and how metrics can have huge impact. And the story, which I didn't tell, but just to give you a you know, positive end of metrics, is there's an organization of about 700 lawyers under brutal metrics, OK? Everyone was miserable. And a new SES comes in and says, shoot, you guys are unhappy. Like your FEVS scores, which we'll, you'll hear about in the next talk in a different uh, agency, are down at the floor. I'm going to make things better. You're going to be internally motivated. We're removing the metrics. All right, so raise your hand if you think things got better. Raise your hand if you think things got a little worse. Raise your hand if you think things got apocalyptically worse. Uh, production dropped by 50%, right? So, you know, we can see metrics are like a sledgehammer, right? I mean, we've seen in terms of motivating people to do the wrong thing, but even motivating people to be really unhappily productive. Uh, so when your or agency wields these metrics, it's important that it does whatever it takes, you know, going back to this thing, to find out where it's wrong. And this is where everyone in the organization comes in. Because if you're at the head of the organization, you implement a metric, do you think you know that that VA scheduler is cheating? Do you think you know those teachers are erasing test scores? Right? So you need to build an organization where finding out whether things are wrong, that information is flowing up so the guy who sees the other teacher erasing things says, this isn't right, and I know uh, how to make this better. Right? And then also that you're setting up a system, and actually this is, we're in the patent building, so I should speak, but they have a really good system in place to check for cheating within their, um, their patent uh, reviews. And then the side benefit of the importance of metrics is as auditors, evaluators, uh, investigators, when you go in and start an audit, if you find out an agency has metrics that can lead to people losing their jobs or getting huge bonuses, that's a risk if there aren't any controls in place to stop people from gaming those, those metrics. Um, so that's about it uh, today. So just we have take home stories. Are you all wrong about everything? It's always going to be that way, but you know, that's OK. No, no, no. <laughs> it's that you should think about setting things up so that even though you're wrong today, you want to fix those errors in the future. And you want to set up your life as a whole so every year, that space of wrongness in your life uh, gets smaller. And then you can go from thinking that the sun revolves around the Earth, which would be pretty cool to be the center of the universe, to actually shooting rockets up into space. So best of luck on having a very productive life. And uh, <laughs> that's all I got to say. <laughs>